you're listening to The Primal Happiness Show, a podcast dedicated to helping you thrive in this crazy modern world. Every Tuesday, we explore the nature of how our minds really work, what exactly the human animal requires to thrive, and how we can live happier and more fulfilling lives. If you're new here and haven't yet taken our free class, then there's no better place to get a jump start on reclaiming your primal happiness. It's where we'll guide you step-by-step through our antidote to today's modern world. Simply head on over to primalhappiness.co slash antidote to get the free class and discover how to thrive without having to move to a planet that's not so crazy as ours. But now, your host, Leanne brooks Tyler. Hello, my beautiful people. A huge warm welcome back to the show. In today's crazy modern world, men and women are living shallow, disconnected and unfulfilling lives. So we created the path for those who are ready to reclaim their wildness and actualize their deepest gifts. This week's show is with Dr. Stefania Shimano. Stefania is back on the show for the second time and oh my goodness, you are in for a treat. Stefania is an energy surgeon devoted to truth and embodiment of your rich genius. She spent nine years in private natural medicine practice before working exclusively with ambitious men and women to increase wealth, vitality and energy in all its forms. Her clients calm their nerves, lose their mental slumps, become attractive again to themselves and their partners and create reliable windfalls of cash in their specific genius without the crash. In this show, we spoke about Stefania's rather naughty sounding philosophy on the power of relating to God as both father and lover and the deep gifts that that provides. I loved this episode. It really is a rich and juicy one. Let's dive in. Hello, Stefania. Welcome back to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, I am so, so excited and yes, completely uh, my pleasure. So, oh, I was just, we were just saying what a juicy topic. It's kind of like, yeah, what a topic. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the father of all topics, actually. Yeah, yeah. Life changing for me, honestly. Mm, yeah, mm-hmm. no, I can't, I can't wait. It's, um, and I think, I can't remember if we touched on this in our last show or in a conversation we had after it, but I was saying this year in particular, my relationship to the masculine and to God has gone through a real shift. And I feel this more available. So I'm, I'm actually thinking I'll probably see something in this conversation that's going to be really helpful to me too. So mm-hmm. yeah, I can't wait for this. So. Before we even get started, um, I think it'd be really helpful for listeners. Like the word God in itself comes with so much baggage, so many like different beliefs, philosophies. So mm-hmm. when you're talking about God and also distinct from, we were saying earlier, you know, like what about the goddess and what about the masculine? What about the feminine? Like when you're yeah. talking about this, how would you define God? How would you, what's your kind of like framework for how you explain these things and speak about these things? Well, I always think of like, how would I tell my son he's eight because he doesn't do concepts that, you know, he's not that old yet. And I would say something like this. I'm talking about universal love, like universal love consciousness that we create from. Mm. if we're to look at it like that. And then if we go a little deeper, it's like, ah, and then is not God all things. So masculine and feminine are both sort of within that framework of universal love consciousness. Mm. And then we would expand from there. So I must picture it like a little diagram in my head, Mm. you know, okay, then what is masculine love consciousness and what is feminine love consciousness? And then we kind of branch out from there to to explain more if that's mm. what you, you wish. Yeah, lovely. That, that I think that's really helpful. Uh, and also, one of the things I really appreciate with you is your the way you're able to dance with your kind of like your brilliance and your logic and these you know sort of deep sort of esoteric co- concepts and the way that kind of you apply that logic onto these things. And I think that's lovely. I think when people are able to do that, it's really helpful because. 
I think um, sometimes we require both, you know, in order to be able to digest these things. So I love that. So when you're talking about this idea of like both masculine and feminine love, love consciousness, would you say a little bit about, I mean, we're obviously going to mostly focus on masculine, but just so that we've got the context, how would you uh, define both of those? Well, it's interesting because when I first started to learn about the the different, um, like the law of gender and the seven hermetic laws, um, there's the yin and the yang fit really well for me. And I was at the same time I was learning Chinese medicine uh, in naturopathic medical school. So I was Mm. able to apply it to the body and, you know, it's very, very tangible that way. So the feminine is like cool and dark and open. It's more like the moon or being underground or water that flows. It's the ability to lean back and receive and let things come to you a little bit. And whereas the masculine, I always use the analogy of like, this is like the knight on the horse with the sword charging ahead. And you can feel how vastly different those two frequencies are. Mm. The masculine is rising and hot and sun and penetrate. And then guess who gets penetrated? <laughs> right? Um, and, and, you know, we, it's funny because people talk about balance of the two to be the healthiest. And in yin and yang, yes, that's how the concept goes. But I really do think as women that if we are focusing on balancing those two, we are going to miss some of the gifts and birthrights of our femininity. Mm. So that's kind of where we're going today. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. It's really interesting because um, I notice over the years, like this show has been going six years, I think it is. And we're on our 300th, 300th odd episode. And so we've had like, you know, similar topics arise over and over the years. And I love it when someone defines their take on something that I've had lots of different people talk about this. It's like there's something fresh in every time I hear someone articulate these things. And I love, love the way that you've just spoken about that. I particularly like the night and charge. <laughs> like charge, night. I just, night, where's the charging bit go? <laughs> he's on the horse, he's got the sword and he's charging ahead. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really love what you've just said then about the balance, but is like, as women, what if the balance is actually um, taking us away from what's fully possible for us? And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into that. So, in fact, where, is that where we should go next? Well, I think what's important to know is, you know, I apply it all to the body. I, th- I bring it all to like a somatic meaning or a, um, representation rather. So, you know, as a doctor, what I, I almost never found a woman that didn't have enough yang. Mm, yes, they all have so a true, yin yeah. deficiency or a yang mm, excess. Yes. So, uh, and I was a, you know, I, I did, I was a doctor for nine years. I saw a lot of bodies. Mm. And what the resounding sort of modern diagnosis of, especially really ambitious women who are used to being the knight on the horse with the sword Mm. is that her yin was deficient. The yang overtook the yin. And then she would turn around one day and have things like, you know, night sweats and hot flashes, or um, she just didn't feel like a woman in this body. It was like there was a dryness, literally and figuratively, if you Mm. know what I mean. Uh, So, yeah. Uh, it, it will affect the body. This isn't just, in, in, in my mind, it's not just like, ooh, this is a cool concept. It's like, ah, oh, you need your body to come with you on your mission, darling. Mm, yeah. It's so interesting you said that because I realized this week that this year in particular, so many of my clients have been, have kind of fallen into a certain category, which I think is actually quite similar to the, to the women that, often work with you who were very high achievers work-wise and often were either in a finance or law, uh, those two fields like show up over and over and over again. And they come to work with us because they are not having the same success in their love life, let's say. And I was 
you know, the same, everything you're saying here applies to them. But what I really love from what you said is like, that's actually true for almost all women in this modern world. Like almost all of us, like you say, it's like there's so much yang and it's like not so much yin. Like that's actually true. So it's just happens the women that I'm noticing are especially expressed in that way but that's true actually for almost all women isn't it really Mm. yeah it's like it's like to me that's almost the real pandemic yeah yeah it really is Mm. okay right let's uh and I think (laughs) there's I'm just trying to think if I want to ask you um Sometimes, what I notice sometimes is if I'm like really in agreement with a guest, I can then not take the time to ask questions that listeners might be wanting, like kind of, yeah, but blah, blah, blah. So I'm just like stopping to see if there's something here that'd be useful. So if, if someone's listening to this and saying, um, I don't know, but so it, are you saying that for most women reversing that and having more yin and less yang, are you saying that's true? Almost. I think what uh, most ambitious women hear that sort of turns them off is that they feel as though becoming more yin and therefore less yang as a result will lead to less productivity, less getting shit Mm -hmm. done, less precision in her business. And oh no, that is not what I mean. No, I think that you can have both and it's, you would preserve your focus. You would preserve your productivity but you, it would be a change in the frequency with which you do it so that at the end of the day, you're not having to have to sort of recoup yourself so much. Mm. The nervous system is balanced throughout the day instead of the looking forward to the weekend when you can crash. It's, mm. There's a sustaining sense. That's where the magic is. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. It's funny, actually, uh, a new client said exactly that when I spoke to her last. Like, so does this mean suddenly I'm going to like, oh, yeah, great. I'm going to have a great love life, but I won't be successful with work. And my answer was similar to what you've just said. I, I see the same over and over again. It's, yeah, it's not that we have to give something up. It's just everything shift to a way of living that just feels so much more juicy and enjoyable and easeful. Um, yeah, so I love that. So coming now to the relationship we have as women to, I guess there's two things here and I, you could say whether there's, there's one and the same. There's that relationship we have to ourselves and to our own feminine. And then there's that relationship we're having to, um, we may as well use the God word at this point, to God, sure. the kind of to the divine masculine. And with the women that you're working with, <clears throat> do you see it as kind of like we need to do some work first on that kind of reclamation of the feminine before we then are able to relate to the masculine differently? Or is this something that you can see is like available simultaneously? I find that if a woman can connect to her femininity differently, starting from her template as a child, and I'm not talking about specifically inner child work, um, but rather. When we're little girls, something happens when we, it's like we all kind of have this memory somewhere in there when we realize that being a woman might not be that great in this world. Mm. When we're little, when we're older, we are like, oh, wait, I got some power. What was I thinking? But Mm. when we're little, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Boys are different. They're faster. Or maybe someone thinks they're smarter because they're a boy. There's some kind of privilege there Mm. that we look at and we're like, ah, well, do I even want to be a girl? Like we all kind of question that. Um, and then, you know, you know, when you get a little older and you get your period, you're like, well, this is a raw deal. Uh, so there's little bits along the way mm. where we demonize our femininity and the world is set up to support that. The world is not set up to say, hey, it's really great to be a girl. This is how you do it in a way that feels good. That just doesn't exist in my culture. It didn't. I don't know about no, where, where no, you completely. Mm. Oh no, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, and the Catholic so Church is, wasn't yeah. very helpful with that either. Yeah, it's so interesting because it's, um, and I think even when 
you've been given um, a lot of freedom around those things. Um, how just life experiences can create that that um, that messaging. Like my, I was raised by a single father who didn't give me that kind of any kind of direct message of like you know women are this way, men are that way. I was given a very um, like expansive. Um, I had real freedom to make those choices myself. And yet life experiences gave me the message that the, the feminine, almost the feminine at that time, I probably would have said femininity and women were weak. You know, that was the, yes. it was like, oh my gosh, like that's the last thing. And from a very young age, I very much related to myself as a boy, actually. I was very, like, very much the archetypal tomboy and actually hated anything at all. I mean, I didn't have any dolls. I really hated anything remotely feminine. Um, so I was quite far in, in that direction, even though it wasn't like I'd been like directly taught that. It's amazing, isn't it, how, how the kind of cultural um, experiences, but also, you know, like personal experiences of people, of things happening to ourselves can give us like a very strong message of like, hell no, that's the last thing I want to be. Yeah, I, I remember, you know, there being girls that would cry easily and it was like always cry baby. Like there was no mm. um there were no no uh what's the word I want? Concessions made for someone to actually have feelings. Mm. Um the more you got done, the more you were praised. I was a very high achiever in school. And if I beat a boy, that was a way bigger thrill than if I beat a girl. Yeah. You know, like, I would be like, take that, you know. Oh my it's, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so true. So true. Yeah. So these are the sneaky mm. ways in which like becoming more man-like is praised. Mm. And so most of the women get that I work with, they get to their 30s, 40s, and 50s, and they turn around and they're like, I've actually been living life as a man. Holy yes. Holy. Yeah. So it's more of that than like femininity is bad, although like we have often misdefined femininity as weak and needy and nagging and like, you know, that word swampy, like just meh, like pitying yeah. yourself or something like that. It's not even that so much as like, oh, but man, this pedestal. Mm. And then I went like, oh, I can do that. You know, yeah. kind of like, hey, I can do anything I want because mm. I also had parents that were like, you can do anything you want, like, be what you want to be. Yeah, and I was like, fine, I'm going to achieve the heck out of this. Yeah, uh, mm. <laughs> and isn't it interesting, like the words you just use there, pedestals? How, on the one hand, we are pedestal men and the masculine, and yet we can't hold individual men in a way where we allow any sense of like devotion or mm. receptivity. It's like the opposite. It's like, no, no, no. It's like, I'm actually putting myself as a man on the pedestal, not yes. actual other men, not men, um, which is fascinating, isn't it? We compete with our partners and mm. then we turn around and we wonder why he's not being the man we want. Yes. Because you're yeah. trying to be the man you want him to be. Yeah. <laughs> There's no room for cops in the kitchen. So. <laughs> yeah. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I, that's so, uh, it's, it's the, the irony is so rich, but it's something that we just don't see until we do see. I think for me, it was huge. I remember the, I think the real first moment of seeing this differently was reading the Queen's Code by Alison Armstrong a few years back. And I was so resistant. My business partner, who's a man, recommended I read it. And I remember I was like messaging him, just like, this is so badly written. Oh my God, it's ridiculous. I'm not going to read it anymore. And he's like, just, just try, just stick it out. And I'm like, no, it's horrendous. Anyway, I, I managed to stick it out. And it was just, it opened everything up in a way that was just like, okay, I can't ever see these things the same again. And there's a whole bunch of work for me to do now. Um, and I've noticed that that particular book, I mean, there's obviously other books that have a similar effect, but that particular book seems to create that in so many women. It's just like, okay, I've, yeah, it's night and day different to how I was seeing things before I read that book. It, for me, it took the relationship with my son's father falling apart. 
Mm. and realizing that I was emasculating this man from like sun up to sundown because I'm that big of an achiever. And he, yeah. he didn't know what to do with that. Like he loved me as a woman, but he didn't know how to be a man in my presence. Mm. And I wasn't letting him. It was a very interesting thing where I was the finger pointer of like, you're not doing this and you're not doing that. And then he was like, are you making any room for me to do that? <laughs> we could, but <laughs> yeah, right. completely. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that was actually yeah. my motivation to do this healing with quote the masculine or the masculine divine was because that relationship was so tumultuous. It was affecting my life, my health, my son, and everything. Um, to uh, that was my like, okay, this hurts so. Mm, yeah so if a woman's listening to this and they haven't already recognized some of their patterns in what we already said what would be um what would be other ways of recognizing um a kind of let's say uh distorted relationship to the masculine stroke god how else do you see that show up in ways that aren't necessarily as obvious Sometimes women have an underlying anxiety they can't put their finger on. That's Mm -hmm. the one I see constantly. It's like, I don't even know why I'm anxious. I don't have anxiety. Nothing is that wrong with my life. I'm not actually in fear for my survival. What is this? Mm. And then we dig in and we we find that there's this, I've got to do it all myself. I'm never going to measure up. I don't really trust him to provide for me. I don't know how to let him. I'm, mm. I'm in a sort of covert, even micro competition with this man. Um, you know, little things like that will, will actually tip a woman's constitution into yang. And she won't know it yet because it seems so normal. Mm. Yes. And it's and been modeled like, everywhere, isn't it? There isn't very much else being modeled. Um, well, this might be... Uh, helpful to look at too. So how does this relate to money in the, Ooh. if we see, um, if we, yeah, it, it, <laughs> it suddenly, it suddenly hit me that often, um, our relationship to money, men, the masculine God is kind of held in like, you know, same kind of thing energetically, how is it that, again, particularly the women that we were just talking about that are highly successful actually have, um, you know, you could say a good relationship to money as in they're making lots of it. How do you see, that sounds paradoxical. On the one hand, it's like, well, why, if you've, if you've got a great relationship with money, why, why would that not apply elsewhere in terms of other forms of the masculine? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I always dig into the woman's actual relationship with money. Um, Mm -hmm. a coach I worked with a while back is she makes a a million or two or three a year, something like that. Mm -hmm. And she, um, was kind of chuckling and letting me know, like, she kind of thinks that you can get to a million pretty easily. It's getting beyond that. That's harder. And I went, well, that, Mm -hmm. that's interesting. So we dug in for her because she felt she had hit a cap in her income. And that's usually what makes a woman's eyes open up a little bigger. Oh, Mm -hmm. well, I've hit a cap. Well, this will not do. Mm. And then, uh, so for her, um, keeping her information confidential, of course, she had the idea that money serves her, but that she was also a slave to money. Mm. And it was very subconscious. She wasn't thinking this outright, but when we dug in, it had become a power over power under dynamic. Mm -hmm. So she was literally in a power struggle with the spirit or frequency of money. And that's why she couldn't go any higher. So Mm -hmm. what I helped her do was find a way to make it a love affair. And uh, everything changed. Mm. Oh, what just came to mind, actually, you know how you were saying um, a woman will be in this kind of covert competition with her partner. Um, That's actually quite a good way of mapping over. Like that's how the relationship could be with money too. Whereas it's like almost like wrangling for top dog. (laughs) Yes. Mm. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, if you think of money as masculine, it can be a very penetrative energy. 
Mm. Like when, if, you know, say you had a launch that made you about 200 grand, 300 grand in a matter of a couple of weeks, you feel like something's mm. penetrating you. Yeah. You can sense it in the body. And if you are, have a wall up to the penetration of masculine energy, something's going to happen with that launch that's either going to affect your relationship, your body, you're going to manifest unexpected bills. There's going to be some kind of no in your yes. field. Mm. Unless you're like, ooh, baby, give it to me. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, like really, <laughs> but it sounded kind of cheesy, but um, if, you know, to let the energy truly penetrate you from a way that feels like, oh, yeah. Mm. Completely different than like, <gasps> what am I going to have to do now for all these clients? <gasps> what does this mean about me now? You know, and like the, the yes. or even the fear that you're out earning your man. Like mm. these are real concerns that, you know, real mortal women have. Yes. Yeah. I, it really does make sense. So this feels like it links really nicely now to um, this idea of holding God as both lover and father. And so, which uh, I, just, I just love the kind of oh, like edginess of that in the first place. But I, as you were talking then, I was like, yes, what you're talking about relating to money in that way is definitely something that I've been deepening into over this year in particular, where there's almost like a kind of erotic charge, you know, like it kind of like does feel quite sexy. Like, yeah, yeah, that, that feels really good. Um, and so it's like, that makes sense. And then it's kind of like, and separately, God is father. Like, whoa, being able to hold both, that's a lot to hold. You know, it's a lot, it's a big concept. It's a, it's a, um, yeah. And obviously it, there's a bit of taboo in there too. So there's a lot of edge. So mm-hmm. I would love first and foremost for you to, again, just kind of distill your philosophy on that and how that's, um, I guess, how you've received holding that energy in both that kind of lover father way well the the day it sort of landed in me was almost a year ago to the day and uh oh, wow. and done, like, yeah it's it's not super recent but it's uh yeah it, it it changed everything within like a lightning bolt that hit my body as if zeus had hit my heart with a lightning bolt and i went <gasps> Like this whole new universal truth came to me. And I remember being on my yoga mat because I was just trying to stretch out my body. I felt all this tension. You know how sometimes when you're getting like a big download of information, your body starts Mm. to like, oh, needs to make room. It was Mm. like that. And at first, I almost felt like I was going to throw up. Because I had this like father and lover in the same man is disgusting. Like this is against all human integrity and morals and all the things. And the information that I got that day was we aren't talking about a human. Mm. We're making it about humans because that's how we move about the cabin called earth. However, God cannot be categorized. That's why this question has remained since the beginning of humanity. What is God? So if we cannot categorize God, Can he also then not be all of the archetypes of man? He can be hero and father and lover and provider. He can be all of these things. So then I, and I, then I started to weep like almost uncontrollably of humanity is missing a deeper, more fulfilling relationship to how God can provide for you because our human mind can't grasp it. Yeah. The human mind makes it gross. We think about our own father. We look at our lover and we're like, I don't want you to be my daddy. Yeah. The brain does all of those Mm. things. But if you kind of walk it back, like backpedal just a little bit to a place of innocence and getting to know God in, in a way that's what we actually really do crave. Because I believe that erotic energy is merging with the divine. Mm. So if we are merging with the divine as the most incredible provider who also loves and sees all of you and that sexual charge that you can feel in your sex, like literally in your body, when you think of God, oh baby, now you're about to expand like crazy. 
Mm. Oh, I love that so much. I love that so much. And it is like one of those ones where it's like I can feel the... I can feel the deep truth in what you're saying. And then it's like, there is definitely this sort of sense of like, am I ready to really allow that in? I've been, since we spoke last time, and um, again, I can't remember if we talked about it in the episode or it was a conversation you and I were having afterwards. We we started touching on these things. So um, since then, I've been playing around with, I guess, the way that I address God when I am praying, when I'm speaking and like trying out different words and really noticing the the feeling in my body. You know, if I say father or God or beloved um, and really noticing like it's so interesting how um, it's like I need to almost like relate separately to him as a father and then I need to relate separately to him as a lover and then it's still again, because exactly what you're saying is because it's hard to separate out this idea of the human roles of those to mm-hmm. a divine being who could be them simultaneously. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because it is almost like I have to do it separately in order to be able to like hold, I can't hold both <laughs> at once. <laughs> yeah, then it becomes like a group thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not quite ready for that. <laughs> oh, that's really taboo. Okay. <laughs> Well, you know, what I started to do was to with the Greek and Roman pantheon of gods. Mm -hmm. This was how I started to play with it. And I used Jupiter or Zeus as my first one, Mm -hmm. who is very father, very provider. Um, (laughs) And I was starting to give him uh, some human forms, like a very Jupiter. That would be like Jason Momoa. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, just a very broad, very sensual, very strong. Like if you're with him, you're probably not that afraid someone's going to hurt you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And then of course, to not humanize him too much, but I started to think of like, oh, he could be a protector, provider and lover. Mm. And then I went a little further with it. And I was like, well, who would be the most lover of the gods? And I was like, oh, that's Dionysus for sure. Mm. And I started to play with that one. Um, and, and then there's Hades, of course, the god of wealth. Mm. So I kind of started doing this little like, okay, am I about to have like a foursome here with God? Like what is going on? <laughs> and then I sort of went, so? Like, <laughs> It's just me with me and my little altar here. Um, I think for a woman to really open up to letting all of those aspects of God be true, first of all, she's got to want it. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is like key number one, to approve of the desire to experience God as all the archetypes of man. Yeah. Oh, I love that you said that. Mm. Yeah. It's um it's interesting. I've been talking um a lot recently in various formats about the power of, I guess, first of all, making contact with those longings, those desires, but then also deciding it, you know, real power in like, okay, yes, I'm gonna have that. And so I love that you've said that, you know, it only becomes possible from that place. Yes, it's usually mm. the woman that is sort of squeezing down her consciousness and I just don't know how I just don't see it Mm. that's not usually the woman that opens up at that time it's the one that's like this is interesting oh that feels cool oh I want that Mm. and then she goes like oh it's a little naughty oh I still like it that's okay you know yeah (laughs) and then she opens so that's the frequency in my experience where a woman is ready the one that's all like I need to see it in step-by-step form. Like, Mm. oh, honey, okay, let's get you a more step 1A than this. (laughs) And no shame, no shame whatsoever. Mm. Like when you're ready, you're ready. And when you're not, you're not. Mm. Yes, completely. But when you admit how badly you want him, this is the key, admitting how badly you want him to provide for you, to love you, to penetrate you, and you are willing to trust your intuition. Mm. And, excuse my language, and fucking do what it says. Yes. Yeah. Mm. That's where it opens because 
women often say like, you know, I, I don't, I don't like the idea of submission even to God. That sounds like, um, like a dominant thing, like a power over power under thing. And it's like, but this is your own mind. you're submitting to your own wisdom which is god speaking through you there's not an i want to be very clear here we are not creating codependency to an outside entity Mm. this is you with you and it's also your god self that is masculine this is another sort of yeah Mm. yeah i really love that let me um Hmm. Let me just cycle back where I would like to. This is so gorgeous. I kind of like, I want to go here and here and here all at once, which is a good work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I really love what you've said about, you know, I guess in a way it is about being ready to open to be in relationship to these different archetypes, these different gods at once. Um, Mm -hmm. so where I was saying, you know, at the moment it's like, I, I, you know, this happens sort of like in quick succession. It's like, okay, I'm going to relate to him as lover and then like full stop, (laughs) then father. Um, is there a point where you're able to enter into a space where it is at once you're, you're actually saying, you know, at once. And I love the way you've, um, personified these, whether that be in kind of mythical God form or Jason Momoa form. <laughs> I love that you personified, but is that really you're in relationship to them at once, simultaneously, you're able to hold that energy where it, it can be all things. Yes. And it, and it, I'm not kidding. It happened like a lightning bolt. Like it must've mm. been where I was that ready, but here's the thing. Like, this is how my relationship with God works. I get these little like, okay. And now you have to go tell other women. Mm. <laughs> like you're not putting this all to yourself. You're going to go do a live in your group next week and you're not going to get a lot of prep. You're going to do this in like 48 hours from now. And I'm like, oh, but, it, but, 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 you know, and, uh, 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 and that's how also my genius works. It's like, ah, okay. Uh, you want this precise piece of information? You need to open up wide, sister. Yeah, you need to let it feel hot. You need to know I got you, and you need to use the words I'm telling you to use. And there's a part of me that went like, oh, "Don't tell me what to do," or I went like, "Oh, but I studied marketing, and this is how it's supposed to be worded." And it's mm. amazing what roadblocks my brain threw up. And I came to the point where I had to let myself experience God as all of these things. Um, the thing is, though. I mean, I, I didn't go down without a fight. Like I was about to barf, you know, and all the things I had said. The thing that, that I want to make sure we're, we're touching on is that you're receiving him as woman. Mm. And that we, um, you know, and the, I completely respect the goddess culture and I spent a lot of time in there. The thing is, if we're focused so much on God as goddess, then we miss the penetrative factor. Mm. The goddess is not a penetrator. She is a source of infinite wisdom and intuition through your psychic gifts. Absolutely. But I think a woman needs to make this little switch to enjoying God as a father and Mm. not the father of like the Catholic church or any of these stern, someone's going to smoke you sort of thing. Mm. Um, But to truly let it be an erotically charged relationship with man and woman. And yes, this sounds very heteronormative. I'm I'm very uh, aware of that, but I I find that men can do this to a point and people that identify as all kinds of whoever you are, my darling, can do this to a point. But when it comes to the feminine body, to receive God as man, This is like, oh, now you're letting yourself lean back into the yin frequency. Ah. Mm. Yeah. I love what you just said there. It feels to me there's a, and we talked about there being a ceiling with money. I feel like it, what I'm hearing what you've said, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of similar ceiling maybe to, 
horizontal. Maybe this is vertical. I don't know. Maybe it's just how I see it. <laughs> There's almost like a ceiling to how how much we can embody the feminine until we're able to receive God in this way. It's like that provides yeah. that that safety, that provision to like fully embody the feminine that isn't available mm-hmm. before that point. I think it can be to people, but I'm not meeting too many women that have nailed it without this concept. Mm. I find there's still always a way in which she feels bereft. Yeah. You know, and a lot of it was my, like I said, my time in the goddess culture was really like hippie land, which is fine. But I can't even tell you how many like broke goddess worshiping people I came into contact with. Where I was mm. like, yes, you're very connected to the land. You're very connected to spirit. Your devotion is clear, but you've told father God to kind of fuck off. Yeah. And that's from like, you're missing an entire half of love consciousness. If you want to bring it back mm. to where we began. Like, why would you shut off half of love consciousness and then be like, where's my money? I have no money again. Yes. Ah, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's the problem. Yeah. No, that completely makes sense. It really does. And yeah, it was, um, and I think this is something, it's one of those things that when you see it, it's so obvious, but mm-hmm. I see this in so many different versions of feminine teachings and you know feminine embodiment all that kind of stuff and it's like yes it absolutely is essential and has its place and is really powerful and if it's taught in isolation or not even isolation but with such a heavy emphasis on the feminine without the masculine there is a real limit there and also I think you know at worst we can be quite dangerous can be quite harmful to relationships it's like the the reverse of what we were saying at the beginning of women being men and masculating men it's like women almost like doing the opposite I guess putting like women and the feminine on the pedestal and there being no room for men there's no purpose for men well I think too a lot of time women seek the goddess culture um not all the time some of women just truly from a devotional place but some of it's like I'm sick of men I'm gonna go be with goddess yes now. yes 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 yeah and then there's it's a like local, she's mm. Or like the goddess of rage. She's Kali. Mm. She's Pele. Mm -hmm. She's, you know, she's pissed. (laughs) Yeah. The American pissed. But yeah. um, (laughs) (laughs) And and then it's like, Mm. there's a shutting off. And it's the shutting off that creates energetic walls. And it also creates what I call like your non-choice reactions to men. We have to learn to not react poorly to men just from a habit so that you don't react poorly to money out of a habit. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes it's really, um, it's very like the volume's turned right up. So it's like a real obvious uh, anger towards men and the masculine. Sometimes it's more subtle, but I see in, I don't know, Facebook posts all the time, this kind of, it's, it's still telling men what to do. It's from a different place, though. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Mm. Still missed the boat. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I really see that. Well, well, we're almost out of time, and I I could spend so much longer exploring this. I'm absolutely loving it. Where do you think would be the most um, helpful place to leave this? What, What have we not covered yet that you think would be, I don't know, maybe... I don't make it sound like, oh, what's the next next three steps? Like, but just what would be a really helpful thing if a woman's listening to this and thinking, okay, I'm really hearing some places that, you know, I've reached a bit of a block here or I can really recognize myself in this. What would you suggest to them next? I think coming to a- approval for your desires and approval of your natural feminine inclinations, that in itself is an initiation for women. We cannot expect men to show up as a king if you are not willing to be a queen that also has softness. We're not just a ruling queen, again, with the sword lopping off heads, which is often where we go when we're scared. Mm. But we actually have to receive the king. And that includes your approval of your desire of how badly you want him. And not just sexually, but as a partner. And that can, you know, there's, there's usually a voice that's been in a woman's head for a while before she gets here. And then it's like, all right. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is an approval of your desires and approval of letting life be different than it is now instead of being all concerned about what you're going to have to give up because there is always a sacrifice on the altar of your initiation and you just have to live with that fact. Yeah. It's so funny. I literally wrote a post about death and sacrifice just yesterday. <laughs> totally, mm-hmm. totally. And we will do everything we can not to do that mm-hmm. until the point where it's just like, okay, like you say, it's like a resignation. Okay, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Fine. You know, <laughs> <laughs> if I must. <laughs> but then it's like there's a there's an other side of it that you'll go, oh, like the breath like re-enters mm-hmm. the body and you realize I wasn't gonna get here until I did that. Yes. Yeah. And there's no way to tell a woman what that's gonna be in advance. That's the like mystery of the feminine. Mm-hmm. You have to be blindfolded to enter the temple of initiation, darling. No one's gonna tell you the path. You either uh, allow yourself to begin trusting yourself and obeying your intuition and admitting Mm. how badly you want him, or you can stay as you are. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I think that's a lovely place to end it. And uh, I had such a powerful example of everything you're talking about here, about acting on intuition, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's actually quite embarrassing potentially and then the magic that can kind of go in you know blindfolded both in terms of what the intuition is leading you to do but then even the next step up like in this particular example even when I acted on it it's like the next thing that happened required I go in blind and um yeah so I absolutely love that and I think there is again that point where we're like okay that's what's next for me it's not going to be safe it's not going to be clear and that's what's next for me and, and sometimes we just need to know other women did it and didn't die. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, I think and that's really there helpful. are many. For anyone who has that next question, like, show me someone. Oh, we have many. Don't worry. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, so before you go, where can women find out about you and your gorgeous work? Um, they can go to my website, which is my full name, stefanishimano.com. And I also have the Wealth Medicine Facebook group and I do live rituals and alchemy things and uh, drop different kinds of wisdom through video uh, into that group for free if that's a place you want to kind of get acquainted. Gorgeous. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I think I'm going to need to ask you to come back again to go deep into another topic again at some point, but this was just beautiful. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure. Oh, wow. What a glorious episode. Here are my top takeaways. If we see that there's pure love consciousness, then within that there's masculine love consciousness, i.e. God, and feminine love consciousness, i.e. the goddess. Most women in our culture have an excess of yang and a depletion of yin, which means they're unavailable to be fully provided and penetrated by the masculine in all its forms, including men, money, and God. I love Stefania's suggestion of finding ways to enter into the relationship with the embodied archetypes of father and lover in all the different ways that can be manifested as both gods, i.e. Zeus, or men, for example, Jason Momoa. Allow yourself to have the deep feminine desire to be provided to and penetrated. It's only from there that it can happen. If you'd like to get the notes and links for everything we spoke about this week, hop on over to the show notes at primalhappiness.co slash episode 316. And if you don't want to miss out next week's episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, or your Android or iOS app of choice and hit that subscribe button. That way you'll get each episode delivered straight to your device as soon as it's released. Thank you so much for listening. You've been wonderful. Catch you again next Tuesday.